We'd been so cautious, keeping quiet, only moving at night. But sometimes, despite all your best efforts, you just get unlucky. We made our way through what we thought was an abandoned street, littered with broken down cars when those things had slithered out and ambushed us. Kaspar, who was always the most trigger-happy of us, panicked and opened fire with his scavenged submachine gun on the largest of the creatures. Big mistake. It didn't slow the monster down, and only seemed to attract more. It'd be Blob City before sunrise now, but poor Kaspar wouldn't make it that long. Fleshy tendrils wrapped around his limbs and pulled him into the terrible mass of one of the creatures. It started reshaping around him enveloping him as he screamed until the tide of flesh coursing down his throat silenced him. The whole time, the monster just kept gibbering madness in a warped voice. Become one, yes. Let ourselves bond and our minds coagulate in the glorious shimmering light. We will all be one in daylight, pretty flower. Yes, yes, yes. And then there were four. Me, Ellen, Darcy, and Jones. There had been more of us once, but in this war of attrition, we always seemed to be the ones who had to lose. And if we didn't get away from these monsters quickly, then there wouldn't be any of us left soon enough. We ran, ducking and weaving around the cars as the blobs got closer. There were so many of them all howling and ranting, zealots for the only cause their melted excuses for minds could understand anymore. Occasionally, we fired back, hoping to slow them down a little, but it never worked. The guns, if anything, were a psychological support mechanism, and something to scare off other survivors who were even more desperate than us. When it came to the blobs, especially the big ones, the only things you could do were run and hope, and hope's in short supply these days. No matter how fast we ran, the blobs kept catching up, and they didn't seem to get tired. Knowing we couldn't outrun them, we ran up to one of the abandoned cars and crouched behind them, breathing raggedly. This whole stupid mission, in hopes of eventually reaching safety, a good night's sleep behind solid walls and some people who actually know what the hell is going on. I drew my sidearm out of my pocket. Even if I didn't make it out of here, I wouldn't turn into one of those monsters. Pulling back the hammer, I muttered a quiet prayer. But there's a god out there. He had a hell of a lot to answer for right now. I looked to Ellen, Darcy, and Jones, and they all had the same idea. It was a pleasure to know them all, after everything that had happened. We heard the blobs getting closer, their lunatic whispers growing in volume and intensity, as they always did before they claimed one of us. I breathed in a sigh, ready to accept my fate, knowing what I needed to do. It all seemed to be over, until he appeared. I looked up and spotted a strange man approaching. He was dressed in an old-fashioned hessian toga, his hair and beard frosty white. I couldn't identify his age or race, but those factors seemed secondary to the fact his eyes were glowing brilliant white, as if exuding pure energy. He raised a hand, the same glowing aura of pure white energy emanating off of it. I'd seen so many things that terrified me in the past six months, but this, this was the first time I'd experienced something I could call awe. He walked towards us with a stillness and confidence and said, you look like you could use a hand. Where were you when day broke? Whoever's left, they remember. I was in a supermarket with my wife and two kids. Just another normal day. I was worrying about bills, taxes, and whatever we were going to have for dinner that night. If the devil exists, I'd sell my soul to that nasty red creep to get those worries back. Lucky for us, we were in the back half of the store, lit entirely by artificial light. The people checking out their groceries down front, right in the front of the building's huge glass facade, they were the first to go down. All these terrible, drowned screams. First, the exact kind of shrieks you'd expect from somebody starting to melt, then the gurgling, like a backed up drain as their mouth and throat melted around the sound, choking it. Those were the first few minutes of hell on earth. I've never been the smartest man. I was a roofer, back when things made sense. Never went to college, never been much for reading. But I had intuition, and I credit that with surviving this long. My dad was in the service. Two tours in Nam. He always told me when I was a kid, the guys who didn't make it back, they panicked. Because that's what the enemy wants you to do. They hope when everything hits the fan, you'll break formation, forget the plan, and all start scurrying in different directions like rats, just hoping you'll be the one who finds a crack and gets out. That's when they get you. When you panic, you're giving up the birthright of reason from letting the animal take over. An animal, son? 
are easier to kill. When the sun went bad that day, plenty of people in that store started running. They didn't know what they were running from or where they were running to. They just wanted to put some distance between themselves and the screaming. Every man for himself. I'd love to tell you all those people are dead now, but in actuality, they were in for a far worse fate. They ran out of the safety and cover of the store, putting themselves at the mercy of the light. Even as they melted, they kept running. They were blobs, slithering away, not even knowing that the thing they were running from had already gotten them. It all happened so fast, but I can remember every single detail. You can judge me if you like, I don't care anymore. If I could have spoken reason to those terrified people that day, hand on my heart, I would have. But one of man's greatest design flaws is that God made fear the master of reason. Nothing I could have said that day would have changed anything. The only ones I could hope to save were my family, so that's exactly what I did. We grabbed what we could, stayed away from windows, and made our way to the nearest supply closet. We were in there for hours, and we didn't come out until things were actually quiet, which coincidentally happened to be night. When we stepped outside the store, we saw the carnage that must have unfolded over the past few hours. Windows smashed, cars driven into storefronts and abandoned, slithering blobs of former people on the ground. In the space of a few hours, the world had truly and irrevocably changed. No matter what happened, even if we survived, we knew there would never be a normal as we'd know it before ever again. The same message was playing on every TV, radio, and computer. A logo I didn't quite recognize, along with an overlay that read, An important message from the SCP Foundation. It explained in an eternally looping robotic voice that they were superseding the control of all world governments to protect humanity from this new and terrifying threat. In short, the sun had turned against us. In some scenarios, survival is a curse. In those early days and weeks, you wouldn't believe the number of times I started to envy the dead. People who'd been wiped off the mortal coil by disease and car crashes and random acts of violence in the days before day broke. They had no idea how good they had it. Little by little, in this terrible new world, death became a kind of luxury. Because melting under the fiery gaze of the sun, that wasn't death, not even close. They seemed harmless at first, tragic, pitiful really. The voices on the TV even told us that, to avoid starvation, we could eat small parts of the melted. But over time, the situation evolved. I don't know when it started or why, but the blobs that had once been people started coagulating. They joined up, started turning into bigger creatures, all with one mind, always screaming and talking madness in a collage of stolen voices. These monsters existed for one purpose, and one purpose only. Finding the people who were still normal and dragging them out into the light to join them. They roamed the world during the night, hunting, seeking, and given night was the only time we could ever safely move, this created problems for all of us. We lost so many to those terrible monsters, including my wife and both my kids. See what I mean about survival sometimes being a curse? Especially when you've got people to miss. I wish they were dead, all three of them, but I still hear them. Their voices added to the chorus of a house-sized flesh monster. But I lived on, if you can call this living. I met with others like Kaspar, Ellen, Darcy, and Jones. All of them had lost people. You hadn't lived this long if you hadn't lost people. We did all we could to keep surviving against the odds. We spent our days in basements and abandoned stores, and our nights dodging the flesh creatures and foraging for food. We eked out each day, taking every breath as it came. We didn't help for anything. Until one day we heard that the people at the SCP Foundation might know how to reverse all this. They needed all the people and help they could get at one of their bases, around 20 miles from us. It'd only be a couple nights walk to get there, we figured, so why not help out the cause? Safety in numbers, after all. And, truth be told, we miss people. After days of hiding and nights of traveling, we were ambushed, but you already know about that part. We lost Kaspar to one of those monsters and got cornered behind an abandoned car. However, as the blobs got closer and closer, that mysterious stranger with the glowing eyes appeared. He didn't walk like the rest of us. He was bold, confident, his back straight as a dancer's, like he feared nothing, like nothing here could hurt him. Suddenly, I felt a rumbling behind me. The car was rattling. I feared for a second that the blobs were crawling over it to get us, but when I turned, I saw the opposite was happening. The car was rising off of the ground, free-floating. 
myself and the other survivors stared in astonishment as the stranger simply flicked his wrist. The floating car was thrown with tremendous force at the largest of the advancing blobs. It hit the piece so hard that the top of it simply splattered off, freezing what was left in place. Even the other blobs paused, seemingly astonished. We all turned to the stranger, still standing firm. Stand behind me if you wish to live, he said. There was something both passionate and commanding about his voice. It was impossible to hear him and not heed his words. All of us stood up and ran behind the stranger as he lifted both hands. Debris climbed into the air. Cars, rocks, broken glass. The blobs were beginning to coagulate again, but this time the stranger wasn't going to let them get the upper hand again. With a slight nod, everything he'd raised flew at the blobs with the force of a machine gun. They were decimated. The bigger ones cut apart the smaller one fleeing to avoid the onslaught. After months of running from these monsters, I don't think any sight could have been more satisfying. When the creatures were gone, the stranger just gave a quiet sigh. He turned to us and asked if we were okay. The answer was, essentially, about as much as we can be. He told us that we'd be safe as long as we stuck with him. And after that display, we had every reason. We had every reason to believe him. We followed the stranger down the long, dark road. He always walked in the middle, fearless, making no attempt to hide. When we asked him his name, he told us that he goes by many names, but for the sake of simplicity, we could call him Matthew. We thanked Matthew for saving us, and he gave a sad sort of smile, and told us that he only wished he could have done more. There was something so strange about Matthew, even beyond the fact he apparently had superpowers. I'd never met the man before, and I'd be willing to bet my right hand on that, and yet it felt like I'd known him my entire life. He was so different, and yet so incredibly familiar. We told them we were on our way to a nearby SCP Foundation facility, where we were told we'd find safe haven. We asked him if he knew where to find it. Matthew told us that, in fact, he'd lived there in that very site for decades. A visitor, just dropping in. He'd had a very stressful job before, and felt like taking a sabbatical while things ran themselves for once. Evidently, my help was more necessary than I imagined, he said. Occasionally, as we walked, we'd see blobs watching us from crevices and dark alleys on the side of the road. They seemed to watch, but for some reason didn't approach. It was the most remarkable thing. Don't worry, he told us. I'm putting up invisible shields. None of them can approach us as long as I maintain my focus. Of course, we'd all heard stories of remarkable and terrifying things wandering the wasteland we used to call planet Earth. You couldn't run into other survivors and groups without hearing whispers about the things lurking out there. Some had told of a giant monstrous reptile that had destroyed an entire survivor settlement in a mall outside of Nevada. Others told that one of those SCP sites was haunted. People spoke about a ghostly man who looked like a rotten corpse who could walk through walls and drag people to hell. But the things Matthew was capable of seemed to be on a whole other level. I asked him what he was, and he told me. Just a humble craftsman, my son. I enjoy creating, though admittedly my creations seem to have gotten away from me these days. His evasion was less funny than he seemed to think it was. I pressed on, asking him what exactly he was capable of. He shrugged and answered that he could do almost anything if he really put his mind to it. I asked, so, ultimate power? This gave him a chuckle. <laughs> he shook his head and said, Let me tell you a story. A man comes upon a maze cut into a cornfield and decides he wants to try his luck. He spends hours getting to the center of the maze, and there he finds the devil waiting for him. Oh. The devil says, Welcome to my domain. Your soul is now forfeit, unless you can complete my challenge and win it back. Of course, the men agreed. The devil said, I can see everything, do everything, and be everything. I know every inch of the universe and can produce anything from thin air. If you want to keep your soul, Name one thing I can't do. Curious, I asked, what did the man say? Matthew smiled and said, Get lost. And for the first time in those long, dark months, I actually laughed. And it was such a stupid, corny dad joke. It's a strange world we live in. Point is, Matthew continued, There is no ultimate power. Some things are denied even to God. 
especially when he chooses to walk as a man on the earth he created. We kept walking for hours. Matthew assured us that we would get there in time, as the rest of us got even more anxious about the thought of the rising sun. He said he'd seen so many sunrises now that he could time them to the second. In the meantime, we should enjoy getting to stretch our legs a little. Even now, the city could be beautiful at night. When he led us all the way to what seemed like an abandoned chemical plant, I could feel my heart sink. All this time, all this work, to find more people, to find safety, only to see that this place was abandoned too. Matthew smiled and said, That's just what they want you to think. He snapped his fingers, and the ground around us began to rumble. The concrete shifted seamlessly, and an entrance opened up below. Heavy bulkheads shifted, revealing a sleek chrome hallway down into the ground. We were astonished. Matthew gestured down into the hall as we descended. Matthew followed us, the entrance closing behind him. I'm just warning you, he said. This may come as a bit of a shock. We ventured deeper, passing through different automated security checkpoints as cameras gazed down from above. Eventually, we found ourselves in what seemed to be a central chamber. It was a hive of activity. People in normal civilian clothes, guards in tactical gear, scientists in lab coats. Tears filled my eyes. It was the most people I'd seen in one place in months. A man in a lab coat wearing an extravagant medallion approached. He was making notes on a clipboard. Another batch of survivors. Good work, 343, the man said. Matthew smiled and nodded. No problem, Jack. Always happy to help. The man with the medallion, Jack, presumably, turned to me. I imagine you've come a long way, he said. I nodded. <laughs> you have no idea. Now go check out SCP-001 when day breaks, and your questions for God answered, for more information on the anomalies featured in today's tale.